This conference will now be recorded. All right, one sec. You guys seeing the full screen? Or are you seeing? Hold on. All right, that should be it. All right. That should be all up and working here. And Friday attendance is down, huh? We're, oh, here we go, trickling in. Weekend. I'll give them another minute or so. Does it say my name is Stephanie Molidor on the screen here? Probably, because I'm probably using someone else's computer. We assumed. <laughs> you never know for anyone signing in. All righty. Uh, all right, 7 o'clock. I guess we can uh, get started. We'll have everyone else trickle in. Uh, for those who you are signing in who have not uh, met me or have not seen you before, um, my name is Kevin McGovern. I'm one of the PGY2s at BAMC. And today we'll be going over a little case presentation and then kind of going over uh, the workup of adrenal lesions, which is uh, what one of our uh, patients presents with to clinic. So let's get started. Uh, the patient today we're going to discuss is Ram. Ram is a 54-year-old male uh, who is uh, with a past medical history significant for obesity, OSA uh, on CPAP, and um, long-term hypertension uh, with persistent hypokalemia, who was referred to the general surgery clinic by his endocrinologist after a full biochemical workup in the setting of a adrenal nodule that was found on a CT scan back in 2018. Uh, as far as his history, uh, the big thing that's been bothersome to him is that his persistent hypertension, despite being on maximal medical therapy, uh, at the time he was previous, uh, he was on a total of uh, up to three antihypertensive agents with persistent hypertension in the 150s and 160s ever since he was in his uh, uh, mid to late 30s. As far as his uh, symptoms, he pretty much feels uh, overall well. Uh, he denies any uh, polydipsia, polyuria, um, any muscle weakness, cramps, dizziness, or lightheadedness associated with his high blood pressure. Uh, as far as his other history, we already talked about his comorbidities, no previous intra-abdominal surgeries. Uh, he's currently on uh, maximum medical therapy as far as what he's been prescribed by his endocrinologist and his PCP on an ARB, a calcium channel blocker, and then supplementation for his hypokalemia. Um, family history, no previous uh, genetic diagnoses of familial syndromes, but persistent hypertension and stroke all throughout in his parents, his grandparents. Uh, and then he's a non-smoker. As far as... Hold on, go back. Hold on, Kevin. Don't no give, worries. Don't give the labs away yet. Christina, what do you think he has? So we know he has adrenal mass with hypertension not controlled by multiple agents without really significant family history. Um, I guess given the topic of the day, my primary concern would be a pheochromocytoma. <laughs> Um, so he had one also, other, there was one other thing in his history that he had persistent hypokalemia. Hypokalemia. Um, that's but, um, aldosterone producing. Uh, exactly. Well. Yeah, so what labs do you want to get? Um, so I would get serum and urine, metanephrine, like basic CBC, BMP, OIGs, and I actually don't know if we can check serum aldosterone levels. Definitely do that. Uh, all right, just go to the next slide and you'll see which lab we have. <laughs> 
so I was working at his labs. His, his exam was pretty much unremarkable. Um, no no uh, obvious physical exam findings. Uh, big things about his blood pressure, it was 150s. On recheck, it was 160s. Um, and this has been serially all throughout his previous um, PCP visits and his general surgery clinic visits. With regards to his labs, you're right, CBC, a BMP. Um, specifically with his BMP, he noted to have hypernatremia of 146 uh, and hypokalemia of 2.7. On previous draws, he's had 2.7, 3.4, 3.1. Um, so it's been a recurrent theme. And then as far as other labs we got, we got serum aldosterone levels, uh, uh, serum uh, renin, and then what we do is something called a uh, renin uh, or aldosterone to renin ratio, which was uh, 36.8. And we'll get into what that means and how does that gear our <coughs> plan for treatment. Bobby, so, what number are you looking for on the aldosterone to renin? I usually go to 20. Yeah. Okay, keep going, okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. So let's just briefly just update ourselves on the anatomy and physiology of the adrenal gland, the retroperitoneal structures located in the suprarenal uh, region. Um, most importantly, understanding the vascular supply. This is a very highly uh, vascular organ. Uh, it has three main arteries. It has the superior, middle, and inferior uh, adrenal arteries. The superior coming off of the phrenic arteries the middle coming directly off of the aorta itself, and then your inferior adrenal arteries coming from the left and right um, renal arteries. With regards to the veins, they're a little different in, um, from the left to the right. The left adrenal vein um, comes directly off of the left renal vein itself, and it's associated with the left phrenic vein. The right adrenal vein comes uh, directly or drains directly into the IVC itself. It is a much shorter but a thicker calibered vessel in relation to the left adrenal vein. Um, this is important to note when you're doing your dissection, which we'll talk about later on in the talk. So yeah, as far as so oh, go, go back one slide, Kevin, just real quick. So the you know this is the textbook answer for the renal artery. In reality, in the OR, you never really dissect out an adrenal artery, right? You just kind of there, as it's depicted there, there are like, you know, who knows how many branches. Um, and you just kind of run along it with some sort of cautery device, whether it's a harmonic or ligature or whatever you prefer. But you just basically vessel seal your way along the edge of the adrenal gland to take all the arterial supply. It's really about the venous dissection uh, in an adrenalectomy. So on the right, like you said, it's this short fat vein. That's kind of the uh, sphincter tightening moment of that operation. On the left, uh, it's a little less scary because the the vein is a little bit longer and thinner, and so you can, you know, you basically have some more room to do some dissection and potentially make a mistake without it being catastrophic. Whereas if you, you know, rip the right adrenal vein, you basically have a hole in the um, in the cava, just like you know when we were talking about liver dissection. If you rip one of those short veins off the off the cava that's going to the liver, it bleeds a lot. Uh, and so I, I think left adrenalectomies are considerably easier than right just because of that one little fact. Um, but the arterial supply, you're supposed to memorize these three vessels. In reality, they don't exist. You just take these small little branches. Point. Thank you, sir. Um, moving on to physiology of the organ itself. Um, the adrenal glands are uh, very lipid-filled organs uh, that are surrounded by a dense capsule. Um, the, der uh, the derived components of the uh, gland itself come from two embryological uh, origins, the cortex and the medulla. The cortex being derived from the mesoderm and the medulla coming from the neural crest cells. And it's important with regards to what uh, each region produces. So let's further break it down. We talked about the uh, cortex and the medulla. Uh, the cortex can be further derived into three different cell layers. Uh, the first layer being the glomerulosa, which is responsible for creating your mineralic corticoids, your aldosterone. Um, the second layer is fasciculatus, which is responsible for creating your glucocorticoids, i.e. your uh, cortisol. And then lastly, um, your uh, reticularis, which is creating your sex steroids, so your androgens. And then um, as far as the medulla, uh, this is important for creating catecholamine biosynthesis, specifically one of the only places in the body that's responsible for creating epinephrine due to the presence of a specific enzyme known as PMNT. We'll kind of go into that as far as um, how that affects uh, with regards to a pheochromosotoma. So now let's get into the meat and potatoes of it, uh, discussing uh, adrenal nodules that are found on CT imaging and how do we work these up. Um, 
in the advent of new, more higher resolution CT scans, the incidence of discovering an adrenal nodule are getting higher and higher uh, as we look at the cross-sectional um, data. Of, it says high is about 5% so of um, all CT scans will find an adrenal nodule, and that number can be as high as 60% as you get up higher in your age, about in the sixth decade of life. What do you do when you find a lesion? Ultimately, you want to know, is this actually in the adrenal gland itself rather than being part of the, um, the kidney or is this a lymph node or some other surrounding structure? Secondly, you want to know, is this lesion functional? And you can kind of do that based on biochemical testing, which we'll talk about, which is relative to each disease processes associated with a nodule. And then ultimately, is there any malignancy associated with the lesion that you find? And we can kind of discuss some properties that suggest if it's malignant or not. And then ultimately, knowing when to resect. So there's a big broad-based differential diagnosis with an adrenal nodule, but you can break it down into kind of first two categories. Is it a benign or malignant lesion? And of the benign lesions, is it functional or non-functional? And running the gamut, for the most part, up to 80% of the incidental lesions that we'll find in the adrenal gland are actually non-functional. I'll go back one slide here. Um, you can see that uh, right here, up to 60% of the adrenal nodules that are discovered are actually a non-functioning adenoma. Of the functioning adenomas, the most common things that you want to think of, about 10% will be a pheo, and the other 10% will be um, known as a subclinical cortisol-producing adenoma. And then malignancy is incredibly rare, okay? It's less than 5% of the uh, adrenal nodules that we'll find. Ultimately, you should also keep in consideration as infection is the back of your differential diagnosis. Tuberculosis cannot uh, often be seen as an adrenal nodule. So when you're working up a patient in clinic, obviously a good history and physical exam, biochemical evaluation, determine if it's functional, and ultimately assessing it radio, uh, radiographically. So let's talk about radiographic findings when you're looking at a CT. Um, ultimately, if you want to further assess an adrenal nodule, you want to obtain a three-phase adrenal CT, which is important for um, it's three phases, one non-contrast, portal venous phase, uh, and then a 15-minute delay. Uh, and based on those right, three... Kevin, sorry. Kevin, pause, why don't you pause for a sec? Let's get somebody involved here. Uh, where'd Sleeveless Joe go? He disappeared. I wanna, he's putting his bread away, I guess. There he is. All right, Tessin, do you, what are you looking for on the imaging? So you're looking at kind of the borders and general shape uh, and heterogeneity or homogeneity of the lesion. You're looking at the timing of the contrast enhancement and washout, uh, as well as okay. the overall Hounsfield units uh, and kind of for the overall kind of fat content and composition of the lesion. And what are the things that make you say, oh, this is something we don't need to worry about? <clears throat> uh, so a homogeneous uh, lesion, uh, with mostly a fatty Hounsfield unit, I think it's like less than 10. Um, yep. Uh, with a lot of washout or a little washout? A lot of washout. Correct. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. So, you're really just assessing for uh, fat content. So, if something is homogenous, well, you know, has normal borders or regular borders and it's really fatty, then you worry less about it. Things that are the opposite of that, you worry more about. So, uh, Kevin, you can go ahead and go through yeah. the criteria, but that's- the I almost burned my French toast. Well, you spot on. Um, yeah, so you, exactly, you basically summed up the whole slide pretty quickly um, and made it easy. Uh, yeah, so like you said, um, uh, absence of paucity of fat, so lipid-rich cells, homogenous appearance, smooth borders. Uh, malignancy, um, like you said, um, other things to keep in mind, malignant uh, cells tend to proliferate rapidly and outgrow their blood supply. You can see associated hemorrhage and necrosis. And with that, you can also see calcification as a result of uh, saponification within the fat. It creates these calcified nodules associated with the lesion. Also, you can find a more malignant lesion. We'll have associated lymphadenopathy uh, and we'll have uh, evidence of local invasion to surrounding structures. Uh, and like you said, size criteria is a very important thing. I'll throw out some couple numbers here. Uh, benign lesions tend to be one centimeter or less. Uh, as you get larger, I, I say the number is cut off is probably four to five centimeters. That number gets up to 75% likelihood of malignancy. Once it's above six centimeters, um, at that point, uh, based on size alone, you'd want to resect that lesion. And then talking about Hounsfield units, benign lesions are usually 10 or less. Uh, they're less bright than surrounding liver and uh, spleen. Uh, and then as far as washout, 
washout is a uh, way that the adrenal gland absorbs contrast and then it's washed out during the delay. Uh, high washout is seen in benign lesions. The number you're going to look for is about 60 to 40 percent on absolute and relative washout. And this is the um, comparison between the portal venous phase and the 15 minute delays. Uh, lower washout tends to be more associated with a malignant lesion. So uh, not, not sure, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to get a good impacts uh, or get impacts working uh, on these computers, but if you can see here, the difference between a carcinoma and an adenoma on the, uh, the non-contrast scan is you can see here, much smaller lesion. Uh, the carcinoma has a little bit more nodular borders relative to the uh, benign lesion. On the contrasted scan, you can see here, it's rel uh, relatively homogenous. Here you can see associated regions of uh, hemorrhage and necrosis into the gland itself. Uh, and then as far as 15 minute delays, oops, sorry there. Uh, there's uh, more of a washout, it's kind of hard to appreciate um, on the adenoma versus the carcinoma on this slide here, as you can see, it's still holding on to its contrast. So let's go into yeah, I mean, different... I think, so real quick, Kevin, go back two slides. That those, I don't know where these numbers came from of 70% malignant over four centimeters. Uh, that may be if you also fit all the other criteria, that number seems incredibly high to me. Um, but the, you know, those numbers are, are good cutoffs for when you should intervene. So the old number was six centimeters. Like when I was an intern, that was kind of what we were taught was if anything over six centimeters should probably come out. People have now moved that down to four because we can do these MIS now. And so the morbidity of doing an adrenalectomy is lower, but the chances that it's going to be malignant are still pretty small. Um, but it just creeps up the bigger you get. And so maybe if you have you know, uh, uh, Hounsfield units over 10 and no washout and you're over four centimeters, maybe it'd be a little higher, but that number is, is, seems a little high. Um, okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so let's go into the different um, functional adrenal lesions that are found on CT and how we work them up. So we'll start with uh, hyperaldosteronism, also known as Kahn syndrome. All so, right. so Kevin, this is this should be all uh, pimp fodder, right? Everybody should. So this is like abscite central, right? They love to ask these questions. So everybody, you just have to get these down. You have to know the different adrenal masses and how you work them up because you will get four or five abscite questions every year uh, on this. So Beth, why don't you make your mic hot? Talk to us about Kahn syndrome. Uh, so, Kahn syndrome, I believe, is the syndrome that describes primary hyperaldosteronism. Um, the etiology of that, you can have an adrenal, adrenal mass, as we mentioned, or you can also have bilateral adrenal hyperplasia. Um, the presentation would be similar to what we were describing about this patient earlier. So, you would have hypertension that was not able to be controlled medically. Um, you would also have hypokalemia as another lab value. And then, um, I think in the, in the actual hereditary version of this, you can also have things like hyperpigmentation or is that, I think that's actually, um, adrenal insufficiency. Never mind. Yeah. Um, biochemical tests, as we discussed, is the plasma, um, aldosterone concentration over the plasma renin concentration. Um, yeah. And then I think you can use a confirmatory test with a 24-hour urinary excretion. Um, and yeah, then that's this, a little, yeah, that, so there's a key aspect to that, right? So you're going to get 24-hour urine aldosterone level while doing something else. Okay. So you're working up other things and you're getting that concurrently too. Well, I mean, it's more specific to aldosterone. So what, what do you want to have that patient doing while you're collecting that aldosterone for the confirmatory test? What should they be eating? And, or you could in, admit them and infuse something. I, I don't Bobby? I know. Uh, like, like salt? Yeah, like exactly. Salt so you want to salt load them. Salt yeah, load. so okay. if it's a borderline test, you can do a salt load and then do 24-hour urine aldosterone. Um, and then that the uh, the plasma renin ratio, you want it to be um, renin aldosterone to be over 20. Typically, the aldosterone, the serum aldosterone is over 30. All these things can be uh, messed with if they're on a bunch of 
like if they're on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Uh, so you have to take them off those to really know for sure. Um, and then the other thing on the on the presentation on the test, they'll always have hypernatremia too, right? So what's the basic physiology there, Beth? What does aldosterone do in the kidney? Uh, aldosterone uh, kind of re gets sodium, keeps sodium. Re get sodium, exactly right. And what else does it do? Uh, what does it exchange the potassium. sodium for? Potassium. Yeah, so excretion of potassium, uh, retention of sodium, so you'll be hypernatremic, hypokalemic, and hypertensive. Okay, keep going. Uh, and then, uh, as far, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please go ahead. <laughs> So then as far as um, your CT imaging where we talked about, it just looks like a benign adenomatous lesion if it's a single polyp or a single uh, nodule. Uh, otherwise, it can, uh, like we talked about, Beth, it could either be unilateral or bilateral hyperplasia, which is not well visualized on uh, CT imaging, which brings us to the next uh, important point about uh, adrenal venous sampling. So once you've worked up a patient for hyperaldosterone, uh, is a consyndrome. Ultimately, you want to now determine which gland you want to resect because if you determine they're overproducing aldosterone is the left or the right gland, we do adrenal venous sampling, which I'll talk about in a little second. But just to hammer home the physiology, Beth, you were right. Uh, how does aldosterone work? It acts uh, on the distal convoluted tubules or down in the collecting duct system to absorb so, uh, sodium and excrete potassium. But it all starts because this chemical is released in low flow states that are delivered to the kidney. Again, back to physiology 101, when you decrease the blood flow to the distal convoluted tubules, uh, the juxtaposition glomerular apparatus senses the low flow state, releasing renin, which then converts, uh, goes to the liver and has angiotensin converted to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is then converted to angiotensin 2 by ACE uh, in the lungs. And then as a direct positive feedback loop, it acts on the, kid or the adrenal glands to release aldosterone. Also of note, angiotensin II is a potent vasoconstrictor. Uh, and any derivative or alteration in this uh, negative feedback loop can result in um, overproduction of aldosterone. And in the sake of Kahn syndrome, it's because there's a, a autonomous production of aldosterone from a single uh, lesion. So how do we know which side, uh, which adrenal gland is gonna be ultimately secreting uh, over or overproducing? If you can't really determine based on CT imaging, we usually do something called adrenal venous sampling where this is often done by our IR colleagues where we can cannulate the femoral vein and pass catheters into either the left and right uh, adrenal vein and basically sample the aldosterone and cortisol levels um, in a continuous fashion. Prior to cannulating these vessels, the patient will be administered a um, uh, bolus of a compound um, uh, cortisotropin, which will stimulate overproduction of aldosterone and cortisone. And basically what you're looking at is you're looking at the ratio of uh, aldosterone and cortisol relative to the ratio of aldosterone and cortisol in a peripheral IV. And that ratio uh, in, a normal in normal physiology is three to one. If for some reason that ratio is four to one, that ratio that is four to one in the left or the right, that'll suggest the overproducing uh, gland, and that would be grounds for an adrenalectomy. Now, say the patient has Kahn syndrome, but it's not localizing, and the ratio is only three to one, that's suggestive of bilateral hypersecretion. And ultimately, so, we do not. So, Kevin, I just want to clarify how yeah. do you know that you're in the adrenal vein when you're doing this? Uh, is this re with regards to um, the levels of your aldosterone and cortisol that you're picking up relative to the vein? Yeah, you're exactly. Like, um, so the I first you, step is to confirm you're in the adrenal vein. How do they do that? Is it just shooting contrast? Incorrect. So they use a biochemical ratio to determine that they're in the right spot first. So like you said, they're giving cosyntropin. And cosyntropin does what? Stimulates, it's, it's basically synthetic ACTH. Yeah, so it's going to make the adrenal gland produce stuff, right? So your, your cortisol in the adrenal vein should be really high. Uh, and so like you said, they draw off the catheter and then they draw off a peripheral vein. The first thing they check is that the, the uh, adrenal vein to peripheral vein ratio of cortisol production is over three to one. And then they know, okay, we're not in the cava. We're in the, it's particularly difficult on the right side, right? Because it's mm. a short little vein. Well, so they want to make sure that the, the uh, ratio is over three to one to make sure they're in the adrenal vein. And that's based on cortisol. 
and then they do this cortisol corrected aldosterone level so they you know basically there's this equation where they divide the aldosterone by the cortisol and then divide the right by the left and that's how they do the normalized uh um you know ratio of sightedness hmm. and then you look for the four to one so you want one side over the other side to be four to one that will be corrected by the uh, aldosterone to cortisol ratio and they luckily the ir guys put this all in a report for you and just spit out a number so you don't have to do any of the math but it you know when you look at these when they come back to you it's like they send off all these different samples and in chs there's like all these there's like 12 samples and you're like what is happening here but luckily they do all the math for you and spit out a ratio but ultimately what you're looking for is four to one and so if you don't have four to one, then what do you do, Kevin? So then if you don't have four to one and it's actually three to one, then it's uh, bilateral hypersecretion. So this is grounds for medical therapy rather than an adrenalectomy. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, there's, you know, the quoted numbers are that 85% of this is from an adenoma and, you know, the rest is either from bilateral adenomas or from hyperplasia. It's hard to tell, but it's actually pretty uncommon that these patients present with like a three centimeter adenoma. They're usually very small. And a lot of times you can't see them on CT scan, especially if they just give you a like bland, normal CT of the abdomen. So I always order a, a CT with fine cuts through the adrenal a CT adrenal protocol. So that'll give you the different washout levels, right? Because they're going to do a pre-contrast, an arterial venous, and then a delayed. So a four-phase CT scan with one millimeter cuts through the adrenal is what you should order. Uh, and that way you can find a smaller adrenal adenoma. But even when you have a small adrenal adenoma with uh, con syndrome, you have to um, you still have to do adrenal vein sampling, especially in patients on, over either 40 or 35, depending on what you read. Um, because it's just so common that patients have bilateral lesions and you have to tell the patient, even if they have, even if they, uh, localize and they have a one centimeter adenoma on CT scan, you still have to tell them there's about a 20% chance that they're going to recur because it's just so common for patients to have more than one, either one, more than one adenoma or hyperplasia. And when you get hyperplasia back on your path, then you feel bad and you know that they're going to recur. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much for clear, uh, clarifying that. Uh, so moving on to the next uh, functional state, we'll talk about uh, hypercortisolism, so Cushing syndrome. So All right. Hold on, Kevin. Hold on. Hold on. We know you know this. Who's next? Uh, I need to find somebody who doesn't. What about Sarah? Are you on? Yes, I'm here. Can you tell us if someone comes in with hypertension and you suspect Cushing syndrome, how do you work that patient up? Uh, sure. So for Cushing's, um, we'll first start with a uh, cortisol level. Um, you can start with the random cortisol, but it's not going to be very accurate. So typically you'll have them do um, a uh, like 24-hour journey, or you can do a morning cortisol level. Um, the I'm trying to remember what numbers you're looking for. Um, if, yeah, I don't I mean, worry about that too much. Okay. Uh, if your cortisol levels are elevated, um, you can go into a, um, a cortisol stimulation test, and that will, depending on whether your um, ACTH also um, is affected by that, it determines whether if this is something that you think is in the adrenals versus extra adrenal, and that can kind of guide your workout further. Of whether you're looking for, um, you know, primary disease or Mets or something that's um, or secondary disease. Okay, that wasn't too bad. The so the <laughs> easiest way. So the problem with a, a random cortisol is what? Um, is that it's random and it's not going to be very accurate. Your cortisol levels fluctuate throughout the day. Okay, good. So what about a AM cortisol on a patient? Uh, is that What's the issues with accuracy in that? What can be false positives there? Um, I mean, people who are on alternative schedules um, aren't going to peak in the morning. Um, if you're taking um, steroids, that will change it. Um, yeah, it's even you know it's even less uh, specific than that. It's just that 
anybody who, you know, they get a bad night's sleep or they're stressed out because you're doing an AM lab on them. It doesn't really, anything that causes stress can cause their cortisol to bump. So when you get that AM cortisol, you typically have them take a medicine the night before. Any idea what that would be? Um, is it? Maybe. Uh, I don't remember. So just you do a low dose, low dose dexame, dexamethasone. Okay, so essentially on everybody, just get used to doing a low dose dexa um, when you do that first cortisol, and then you draw an A, and then I would just draw an ACTH as well. So now you've done your low dose uh, dexamethasone suppression test, and you're going to get a cortisol and ACTH, and then you can pretty much uh, have your answer at that point. Okay, so. Yes, sir. Um, uh, so what would you expect to see on that if they have Cushing syndrome? Um, so if you have Cushing syndrome, um, you're going to expect your um, cortisol to be high and your ACTH to be low. Okay, good. And then if their ACTH is high, this is not adrenal uh, specific. This is not adrenal, an adrenal topic. But for the abscite, you should know, right? If the let's say the ACTH comes back high and the cortisol comes back high, then what do you expect? Then you're looking for something um, either uh, for low dose, you're looking for either pituitary or uh, extra adrenal, like a lung met. Yeah, and then how would you differentiate between those two? Uh, then you can do your high dose de dexamethasone test. And which one will suppress? Um, the ectopic will suppress. 50-50. Oh, sorry, the brain, right. brain, sorry, the brain will uh, Breath. Yeah, so like a uh, perineoplastic syndrome or some exogenous uh, uh, cause will not suppress with high dose, but a pituitary tumor will suppress with high dose. So that, you know, that again is like abside fodder. You got to know that algorithm uh, every time. All right, go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. Awesome. No, it's not awesome. <laughs> that's that's so it's really, awesome. Uh, really uh, quick. Say say for everybody. You want to make it very clear. Which is Cushing's disease? Okay. Which is Cushing syndrome? I don't know if everybody heard that, Brandon. Just for clarity, someone say, what is the difference between Cushing's disease and Cushing's syndrome? Uh, Cushing, Cushing, syndrome, okay, Cushing syndrome is the clinical manifestation with moon facies and weight gain and so forth. Cushing's disease is the pituitary tumor causing <laughs> Cushing syndrome, essentially. That's what I remember. So I, I'll defer to the other staff. But that to me is accurate in that Cushing's disease is mediated by the pituitary and Cushing syndrome is not. That's right. Hey, Christina, I mean, it's, a, it's just the cause of Cushing syndrome in the United States. Hi. Sorry, say again. What's the most common cause of Cushing syndrome in the United States? Oh, iatrogenic from steroids that we prescribe. Exactly right. It's doctors all the time when we're giving people steroids for other things. On the list of Cushing syndrome causes, how high up is adrenocortical cancer? Uh, I would only be able to say ballpark. It's a, one of the lower. Yeah, it's almost last on the list. So that's what you got to keep in mind with all these things. So the next uh, functional state, um, uh, we won't talk too much about it because it's relatively rare. It's the virilizing and the feminizing tumors. Uh, hey, Kevin, Kevin, one sec, just to... Yeah. to uh, uh, finish off what Rob was just saying, right? So adrenal cortical carcinoma, we may get to this at the end, but if you, it's pretty unusual to have like an, an aldosterone producing ACC. ACCs will typically produce uh, uh, cortisol. So they're usually going to present with either Cushing syndrome or a combination of Cushing's and virilization. Uh, so when you have a Cushing's, when you, pre when somebody presents with Cushing's, it's an adrenal source, but they have some sort of big, weird mass and something's funny about it on imaging. That's when you should think about ACC. Again, to Rob's point, very rare in real life, but could come up on the test. Awesome.
uh, and as we talked about virilizing tumors and feminizing tumors, um, we won't touch a lot of it on it right now, um, but it, considering uh, it's very rare, again, these are, um, the etiology behind these is basically an androgen or estrogen secreting tumor that's come from um, the uh, reticulara of the uh, cortex. These are about 50% of them are associated with malignancy. That's why if you do have these and they are diagnosed on CT finding, it's often associated with a malignant state. Um, they'll present in two ways. Uh, if it is an estrogen or an androgen producing tumor, um, estrogen is more common. Um, in women, it'll uh, cause precocious puberty in younger adults. In uh, individuals who are in menopause, it'll cause some postmenopausal spotting. In men, it, they'll present with uh, gynecomastia. Uh, for the androgen tumors, it's uh, mostly seen in uh, females, which will cause hirsutism and uh, some menstrual irregularities. And any tumor or uh, any adrenal nodule that you're working up, you're going to send off uh, some plasma, testosterone, uh, DHEA, sulfate, and androstenone thione. Um, all three of those you'll send off um, and kind of uh, work into your clinical picture. Ultimately, looking at the CT scan, um, the findings for an aldosteronoma, cortisol, uh, cortisol secreting, and um, adenoma, and a virilizing uh, tumor that's benign, they'll all relatively appear the same on CT. Uh, lastly, I won't, I won't touch too much on it, but uh, FIA is something to keep so Kevin, in mind. Kevin, one sec. Go back to the the uh, virilizing, feminizing. So just abside questions, stuff you got to know. Beth and Christina, either one is fine. Uh, so most common congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Mm. Is that 21? Correct, 21 hydroxylase, yes. So you just have to know that one. At, at the end, I'll put my screen on and I'll show a little figure that I would suggest that you sort of at least vaguely memorize uh, come at site time. But yeah, so you just gotta know 21 hydroxylase. You don't really have to know a ton about it to be perfectly honest, just know that that's gonna be the answer on the test and it's gonna be virilizing and salt wasting. Uh, and then the other one, I wouldn't worry too much about beyond that, but that's the way it'll present. All right, go ahead, Kev, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, and then we'll go touch basically on FIOs. So FIOs, unlike the uh, other functional uh, adenomas, this involves overproduction of cells within the medulla. Uh, as we remember, <laughs> the um, uh, medulla is responsible for converting norepinephrine to epinephrine. It's the only place in the body that actually contains this specific enzyme, um, phenyl and toluene and methyl transferase, which transfers a methyl group to norepinephrine, causing epinephrine. Um, with regards to their presentation, uh, the classic. So Kevin, just on that on that point, why does that matter? How can you clinically, uh, you know, if you were writing an abside question, how would you write that question? What's the clinical translation of that random pathophysiology pathophysi that you're supposed to memorize? With regards to where it's located. Yep. Um, so if you have a FIO and it's producing epi, specifically epi, where does it have to be? Either in the adrenal gland or the sympathetic chain or? So that's, no, that's incorrect, right? So it can only be in the adrenal medulla because that enzyme only exists there. So an extra adrenal FIO will not produce epinephrine, it will only produce norepinephrine. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So that's like a, you know, it's, it's again, it's sort of random abside quizziness, but they can ask the question that way, right? So they can present with a FIO, but uh, they're, they're, for whatever reason, they draw a norepi and epi level, which is crazy, but, uh, and their epi is not, they don't, they're not producing uh, epinephrine or the breakdown of epinephrine. So they don't have metanephrines, they only have nor metanephrines. That would be an extra adrenal. Theo. So that's kind of a, again, it's not overly important, but that's the only reason that you need to memorize that little fact. Awesome. Thank you. It's not um, just on the abscite though, either. The little baby, I know I've told some of you guys about, but uh, he has a adrenal mass and elevated epi, so you do see that clinically. Wow. Awesome. So um, you leave it to the pea surgeon to make irrelevant things relevant. That's perfect. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's not go into, I don't want Kevin yeah. to give any more away at Meg. Uh, I, I just scrolled down and realized there were a bunch more people on here. So now I can ask more people questions. 
So Meg, tell us about the workup of a, a, a pheochromocytoma. What are you going to get? Uh, you want to get urine metanephrines. Excellent. All right. So what's the what is the uh, good and bad of plasma versus urine metanephrines? And this is true of most plasma and urine tests. Still looking at you, Meg. Keep your keep your mic green. Um, so the, I mean, is it something about the kidneys? It's not. So, uh, a plasma test, right, is going to be a one-time random oh, okay. draw. So the good thing about it is that it's a one-time random draw. You don't have to take a jug home and collect your urine for 24 hours, which people don't really love to do. But what's the downside of that? What's the downside of a one-time random draw? It's not as accurate as the 24-hour collection. Yeah. In which way is it not accurate? Is it less sensitive or specific? It would be less specific, right? Because you could have an increase yeah. for a lot of different reasons. Yeah, exactly right. So the 24 hour is going to be a full day's worth of kind of ups and downs, and it should balance out over 24 hours where a random draw, you could just catch somebody, they're stressed out, they're getting a blood drawn, you know, they just saw the doctor, whatever it is, they're stressed out. So uh, if you have a borderline plasma, you're going to get a urine to confirm. Uh, and that can be, even if like you have an elevated, uh, if I had an elevated plasma, I would get a urine confirm it because you just don't want to take somebody to the OR based just off, just off of that. Um, there are other things that, so Kevin, any, what other tests could you do? Sorry, I'm going ahead of your slide here, but oh, yeah. um, so if somebody has a borderline yeah, high metanephrine, but you don't really believe it, what else could you do? Borderline metanephrine. Um, okay. Uh, other than a 24 hour urinary catecholamine and metanephrine after that plasma test. Yeah, that one's a little high, but you don't really believe it. Maybe you think they just had a stressful day. Johnny, are you trying to chime in? I had a question about the sensitivity. Oh, yeah. specificity. You, your question was, is the plasma metanephrine, what's the sensitivity and specificity as related to the urine? Wouldn't the plasma yeah. be less sensitive and less specific? Because you're getting, it's only a one point in time, it's, you're less likely to pick it up, so it's less sensitive. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, that may be true, but, you know, the false positives are when people Donnie, are I got of, one right. Leave me alone. <laughs> no, so, I mean, the false positive is what you worry about, right? Because it's it, people are stressed out. They're getting the blood drawn, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so I would use the plasma more to rule it out than to rule it in. Hmm. If you get a plasma and it's totally normal, then, you know, they probably don't have a FIO. But if you get a plasma and it's elevated, it could just be a false positive because of whatever stressful thing is going on during that time. And then, you know, if you're, these things are rarely used, but if you're 24 hours high and you don't believe it, you can do, they used to do clonidine suppression where you gave somebody clonidine and then redrew the 24 hour. Or there are crazy things where they talk about people like putting people in uh, like green rooms and getting them to meditate and then drawing their, their metanephrines. That's the other thing people talk about, but, uh, Anyway, so just be aware that the false positives are common, uh, and it's mainly because you release metanephrines when you're stressed out. That green room All sounds right. nice. Um, is is that similar to like a dexamethadone suppression test, where people will use like the low dose dexamethadone suppression test as a screening test for hypercortisolism? With the same idea. Um, so I read it as plasma metanephrines is usually your, your initial test, and if that is positive, then you'll get the urinary. Yeah, I mean, the reality is that people don't like collecting 24 hours of urine. And so if you have a low suspicion and you get a plasma metanephrine and it's low, then you can just kind of tell them that they don't have a FIO. Okay. But, uh, you know, like sometimes if you have somebody with an adrenal mass and hypertension and it's not clear what's going on, you literally send them home with multiple jugs to collect multiple days worth of urine, mm -hmm. which is not great, right? So if you can avoid that by just doing a bunch of blood tests, then that's what you do. Okay. Start and you need to keep all that urine in your refrigerator. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, uh, and then the you other... have to walk back into the lab with multiple jugs of your own urine in the middle of the day. People don't love doing that. So. And it was next to your butter. 
<laughs> <laughs> Everyone's favorite patient. Um, and then the important thing is to know the associated familial syndromes with um, FIOs. Um, obviously, the most important one which we get to pimped on is the MEN syndrome, so MEN2A and MEN2B. But also keep in mind um, uh, neurofibromatosis 1 and von Hippel Lindau can be associated with FIOs. And then last but not least, the big thing we'll Hold touch on. Hold on, go back one slide, Kevin. Sorry. Yeah. What time is it? 7.44. Um, so the, the way that you, you should think about that is it's sort of the opposite way, right? So when somebody presents with one of these other things, you need to think about FIO. It's not so much the other way around, particularly the chiefs for oral boards, right? If they give you a patient with neurofibromatosis, you have to make sure they don't have a FIO before you do anything else. Same thing with men's syndrome, right? So like one of my oral board questions was a thyroid mass. My algorithm for oral boards was I got a calcitonin on everybody for with a thyroid mass, even though you wouldn't do that in real life. On the oral boards, I did that. And Christina, why would I want to check a calcitonin? What are we, what am I, why am I talking about calcitonin and thyroid masses right now? Can you connect the dots for the medical students? For the medullary mass. Yeah, and if they have a medullary thyroid <laughs> cancer, what else? What else on the oral boards? What else do they have? Associated with men too. Yeah, and so they have a pheo, right? So what you don't want to do is on your oral boards, don't take a patient with a medullary thyroid cancer to the OR because they will die on the table because you forgot to rule out pheo. So just that's the important thing about those associated things. It's not so much that when you diagnose a FIO, you got to look for neurofibromas. Who cares? It's the opposite way around. If they give you a patient with a colon cancer and a bunch of neurofibromas and a little hypertension, make sure you send a plasma and metanephrine at least uh, to rule out FIO before you go take them for the colectomy and then they die on the table. So that's the important thing there. Um, and then just real quick, Kevin, before we move on, uh, why don't you tell us how you get a patient ready for the OR if they have a PO? Oh, yeah. So for, if you want to get someone ready, you really want to make sure that you optimize their volume status. Um, you want to be able to make sure that they're also, you can basically salt load them as well. Um, make sure they're well hydrated. Uh, That's other like things step you wanna, four. You forgot a few steps. So you want to make sure their uh, blood pressure management. Okay, how do you do that? So you want to make sure that you do not give a beta blockade before you give an alpha blockade. You always want to make sure that they uh, you put them on board with um, oral and uh, start with oral alpha blockers. So doxazacin yep. is the first one, um, and then intraoperatively uh, you can give the uh, IV um, fentolamine or um, phenoxybenzamine, um, and then after that. Uh, then you want to then you can give beta blockers, at, but you want to make sure they're alpha block before they become beta block. That's a key point. Um, uh, okay, good. Yeah. So the same is true. Brandon Proper taught me this when I was an intern. If someone comes in high on cocaine, same thing, right? So don't give a beta blocker to that patient either. You want to block the alpha system first, or else they'll have ridiculous hypertension and you know have a stroke or something. So uh, if you alpha steal like first, all my if you steal all my PIM questions, I will run out. I don't have another one to back that one up. I can't <laughs> believe you're still on, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> um, so yeah, alpha blockade first. Cardura is a good drug because it's one alpha, sele alpha one selective, and it also is long lasting. So why would you want an alpha one selective alpha blocker over a non-selective alpha blocker, Kevin? Um, this, is a, uh, this is a physiology heavy lecture today. This is, this is a result of um, you can bottom out their blood pressure, or so if you give them why well, you want to give them alpha one as opposed to an alpha two. Um, yeah, I mean, if you don't know, it's okay. Uh, Caitlin, do you know why? It's not that big of a deal, but if you give a non-selective alpha blocker, what are you going to end up with? I can't remember. Oh, so it's yeah, yeah, you yeah. Get, you postural, get, postural hypertension, hypotension. 
So you're going to get postural hypotension either way, right? Because you're relaxing the blood vessels. But if you give alpha-2 blockade, then you're actually going to get tachycardia because alpha-2, right, turns down all the sympathetic drive. So now you're actually turning some of the sympathetic drive up. You're, you're blocking alpha-1, so the blood pressure is going to stay low, but you're actually going to turn up your beta a little bit. And gotcha. so you get reflex tachycardia. So the classic teaching in FIOs has always been give the alpha blockade, and then once you get tachycardia, give a beta blocker which it used to always happen when they gave non-selective alpha blockers, you would pretty much always get tachycardia and then you would give a beta blocker to counteract that. Now with alpha one selective alpha blockers, you get less reflex tachycardia. So that's just a subtle thing there that that's why you give an alpha one blocker instead of a non-selective alpha blocker because you get le less reflex tachycardia. Now you said something about postural hypotension, hypotension. What are your goals on alpha blockade? When are you done alpha blocking the patient ready to go to the OR? Um, as far as like you one want early. postural hypotension, have you gone too far? That's when you know you've effectively alpha blocked them. Yeah, exactly. So that's actually your desired endpoint is a little bit of postural hypertension. So they should be a little dizzy when they stand up by the time you're ready to go to the OR. The other thing you look for is rhinorrhea. So if their nose is running, um, they uh, then that's another sign that they're ready. So uh, just real quick, Rob answered this question, but I was not saying that everyone with a, a medullary has a FIO, but on the oral boards, just assume that they have a FIO if they have a medullary, right? So that's how they try to trap you is that the patient's gonna have a FIO. Uh, sorry. Um, so yeah, so Kevin, again, you gave them the alpha blockade, their blood pressure is now controlled. They have a little bit of, postural hypotension, and now you have, it's Friday, and they're scheduled for surgery on Monday. What are you going to tell them to do over the weekend? Uh, you're going to tell them to hydrate, eat a heavy salt meal, um, basically salt load them, increase their volume status. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, you can, you can even admit them. Some people admit everybody the night before, not often anymore, but if you have an unreliable patient or, you know, you have some reason, you can admit them and just give them a bunch of IV fluids over the weekend. But yeah, you're going to tell them to go eat a bunch of salty food and drink a ton of water uh, before they come in. And then, like you said, you should have a IV alpha blocker ready in the OR. What else should you have ready in the OR? Uh, nitroprusside. Um, yeah. Okay, good. So you want a venous dilator, you want an alpha blocker, a beta blocker, and then once you clip that adrenal vein, what do you need to have ready? Oh, um, ep epinephrine? Yeah, just pressors basically, yeah, right? Pressors. So you want to have a selection of vasopressors available. So some of these patients will bottom out as soon as you take the tumor out. And then, you know, every once in a while, they even need to spend the night in the, in the ICU afterwards to, to help their blood pressure. So, Liv, yes, I, we are looking for people's nose, noses to be running when they come in for this operation. That is correct. Uh, all right. Is that enough on FIO? Did we beat that horse? Yeah. Rob? I think Grand Blue, Grand Blue wanted to stress to everybody that there is such a thing as an emergent adrenalectomy for FIO. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, Wait, Rob, actually... Rob got to live that nightmare this year. That's what. Am I? I just want to. I'm confused. Why is somebody's nose going to be running? I because I feel... because you've given them an alpha blocker, right? So what's in cold medicine when you have a runny nose? What do you take? Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Thank so you. You take a you take an alpha adrenergic medicine like phenylephrine when you have a runny nose. You want you want to block the alpha. And one of the side effects of that is a runny nose, but that's actually one of the things you look for for effective alpha blockade is that their nose is running. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. All right. Real quick, did y'all talk about genetics in FIOs? Did I just miss that? A uh, little bit. Keep, go ahead. Whatever you want to highlight. That's funny. So I don't know if they're still teaching this 10% thing where they think 10% of FIOs are bilateral and 10% are hereditary and all that. That is no longer the case. Anybody that comes to you with suspicion of FIO automatically gets genetic testing now because up to 30 to 35% of these patients will have a germline mutation and, a, and something that will um, influence FIO. So just remember that now, like 10%, throw that away. Anybody that comes to you with a clinical suspicion of FIO, get genetics. Throw that away for real life, but maybe not for the test yet. 
because the tests always lag behind real life. But yeah, certainly, yeah, I, I agree, Rob. That was our algorithm and fellowship too. Anybody with a FIO got genetic testing. All right, what else we got, Kevin? Uh, last but not least, I want to talk about just your brief um, the other malignant uh, lesions that are associated with the adrenal gland, uh, adrenal cortical carcinoma. Again, this is incredibly rare, a very uh, low percentage um, to be a malignant lesion when you see a nodule. It's usually less than uh, I've seen five, less than five percent. Um, the overall incidence of an adrenal uh, cortical carcinoma is usually well, I've seen quote it was two in a million. Um, it's an incredibly rare uh, endocrine malignancy. Oftentimes, they'll present um, first with uh, Cushing syndrome, and the next virilization, and very rare that they'll have uh, hyperaldosteronism. Uh, in pediatric population that have ACC, they'll have uh, virilization is the most common. Again, diagnosis, no rule for biopsy. Ultimately, you want to look at the um, CT three-phase uh, uh, adrenal um, scan, and you can kind of look at the diagnostic features that we talked about earlier in the lecture that will lead you to that um, diagnosis of ACC. And ultimately, I'm not going to really get too much in depth with it, but the uh, treatment for that is a radical adrenalectomy with adjuvant uh, radiation and uh, chemo with a drug called uh, Meditane, uh, which is a drug that um, inhibits the um, enzymes within the adrenal cortex, in addition to being specifically cytotoxic to the cells within the uh, adrenal cortex itself. And then when we're talking about um, adrenal METs, the second most common uh, cause of an adrenal nodule that you see is actually a um, adrenal mass that's a result of metastasis rather than a primary uh, adrenal um, uh, cancer. Uh, and some common All sites. Right, so, who, yeah, for your next slide there, let's go yeah. to Johnny maybe. What what tumors go to the adrenal gland? Melanoma. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. Melanoma is probably the most common that we actually see. What else could go there? Lung cancer. Good. Lungs probably second. And then grab bag. So yeah, basically anything can go there, right? It's a highly vascular organ, but yeah, I would think uh, melanoma and lung will be the two that you'll get asked on the test, I think. So renal cell is a very, you know, it tends to go through vessels. So uh, that's one reason that it goes there. Breast is another one that comes up, uh, but it's sort of a grab bag after lung and melanoma. And then this algorithm kind of sums it all up. What, what do you do when you see an adrenal uh, lesion? Um, you do your biochemical testing, determine if it's functional, rule of thumb. If it is functional, then you want to take it out. If it's not functional, then we go based on size criteria and specific um, uh, characteristics seen on imaging. Um, so that's pretty much what I've uh, touched on today. Uh, again, uh, I can't really pull up our patient who came into clinic, but his non-con CT uh, showed a small left-sided benign adrenal nodule that was about a centimeter in size. Uh, it met the criteria of Hounsfield units being less than 10, um, and he had high washout of 65% on uh, the absolute washout. Uh, he had adrenal venous sampling, which localized to the left adrenal vein, and based on all of this, he was uh, seen in clinic actually last week, and I think we plan to book him for a adrenalectomy um, next week. Is that correct? No. So... This is a, how quickly should we take this guy to the OR, right? We're in the middle of COVID craziness, right? Mm -hmm. Is this one of the guys that the OR committee is going to let me operate on? Fortunately, probably not. No shot, right? So he's going to get surgery. Who knows when? I called him and, you know, I mean, there's no rush to do this. It, right. it, it's it's going to help his hypertension for sure. He's on, I think, three medicines. He may get down to one or even zero if he really has a single adenoma. But these things are, this is not a life-saving operation really or anything. It's not an urgent or emergent thing. And the, unfortunately, the first one of these that I did, the guy recurred. Kalen, how quickly did that recur? He, he had low blood pressure for like a week. <laughs> so pressure creep back. Yeah, I think it was about a week. By the time we saw him for his two-week post-op visit, he was back on meds. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's the reality of this disease is that even when they localized, that guy, his ratio was like 4.5 to 1 or something. I mean, he localized, but he had hyperplasia on his uh, on his path, and, you know, you just knew he was going to recur. And so, um, you know, don't oversell this operation is the reality. We can take adenomas out, and that may help some people, but 
uh, like I said, about 20% of people are going to recur even if they localize well. And then I was going to talk about the operation itself, but it's 8 o'clock for M&M. So after M&M, if y'all want to uh, talk about the operation, we can. But one one key thing just on that that CT, can you pull the CT back up real, real quick, Kevin? Yeah. Uh, so my criteria for approaching from the front or from the back for the Chiefs has a lot to do with, uh, and Caitlin got to experience this while she was on service, I think, or maybe it was Kai. It has a lot to do with where the adrenal sits relative to the top of the kidney. So you can, this scan that doesn't perfectly show it, but you can imagine where the top of this guy's kidney is. And then his adrenal gland is a couple centimeters above that. So he's a good candidate for a posterior approach. When their adrenal, some people's adrenal gland sits almost in front of their, um, in front of their kidney. So their kidney is kind of here and the adrenal gland is actually up in front. Those are very difficult, if not impossible, to approach from the from posterior. I think that that was, uh, I think that somebody did a case with Travis like that, where the adrenal gland was like way anterior, Caitlin did, and it's it's not ideal. So those ones you can approach from the front robotically or lap, but the ones that are high up like this, you can approach from the back, and it's three small incisions in their back. They have very minimal pain. You don't have to mobilize the colon and do all this stuff that puts them at risk for ileus. So that's a nice, uh, a nice way to take these things out. Uh, there's some side conversation about MIBG. Um, yeah, agree with Rob. Dotatate has replaced MIBG, and those are, you know, you would do that test right when you can't tell. So if you, if you're sure they have a FIO, but you can't see it on CT scan, uh, then a Dotatate can sometimes light those up even if they're small too small to be noticed on CT scan. Again, I think with one millimeter cuts through the adrenal and four phase CT scans, it's not very common anymore that you can't see a, an adrenal mass. So I think that uh, a lot of those things have fallen out of, uh, out of really practical use, um, except I guess neuroblastomas. So it's eight. I think for, you know, most, um, We'll just we'll just uh, we'll divide the functional humans from the non-functional humans by if you have an iPhone versus an Android. If you have an iPhone, then your time should say eight oh one. And we'll <laughs> let's let's take five minutes. If you have an Android, I can't help you. <laughs> so eight oh five. Oh, everyone, take like four minutes. Who's presenting the first case, Kai? All right, anybody but Kai, please present the first case. I am, and then um, Lydia has a second case, but I don't see that she's on yet. She, uh, scheduling party fell, and I scheduled her to present when she's on trauma, so. Yeah, um, right. she may be busy before she So I'm gonna make you the, I'll make you the presenter. Is that cool? Okay, yeah, that's fine. Do we wanna record Eminem though? Cause you're still recording. Yeah, turn that off, Tim. This conference will now be recorded.